Thank you for joining us for our first Silicon Valley based total access panel, uh, Death by Board Meetings. It was a title I stole from a friend of mine, Nick Sturiali, who's now at Ignition Partners. I'm unfortunately a good make it today, but I think it's a pretty descriptive uh, title for the panel that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we have a couple things coming up, as you keep in mind, if you're in the mobile payment space, we have a panel on April 2nd. Uh, the copy of the invitation is in there and that will be held here. If you're getting ready to raise money, we are kicking off our four-part fundraising series in San Francisco on April 10th. Uh, part one basically allows you to build, do the building blocks of your uh, presentation, financials, uh, operating plan, value proposition, go-to-market strategy, market sizing, and competitive landscape. Part two of that will be an, an elevator pitch training. Uh, part three is we will break groups of entrepreneurs into ten with two investors for three hours of coaching. And then part four is a sort of standard get in front of the companies that are selected out of part three present to eight to ten funds uh, as part four. Uh, the difference between what we do and a lot of other people do, you leave with scorecards, which is a little bit painful, but also very very direct and granular feedback on your story. Uh, then we'll do a, be doing a virtualization storage panel on February 15th with Lightspeed. And then somewhere before that, not that we don't have enough going on, there'll be a uh, panel on security, which we're building around the uh, uh, chief security officer at Wells Fargo. So if you have anything that makes noise, if you could please turn it off, that would be great. Uh, we thank you for joining us, and as always, if this you find this time is worth your time, please invite your friends. That's how our program has grown. I'm going to turn it over to Greg Heibel, who's a partner in our program group, who will be moderating, who is standing behind me. You, just, you stand behind Chad, and you can't be seen. That's a <laughs> chronic problem. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. I love this topic, uh, which proves that I'm a corporate lawyer because nobody else loves this topic. Uh, <laughs> But I spend a lot of my life in board meetings. Uh, some are great, some are good, some are horrendous. Um, and there are some common themes that you go to enough board meetings and you start to start to pick up on what those themes are. And, and you start to think, wow, I could run a board meeting better. That's not true. That's why I'm a lawyer, and so I don't, I don't have to run the, the board meeting. But uh, we've got a, a great panel of, of folks who actually do and have, and, and not only do they attend Board meetings, but they've run a lot of they've run a lot of board meetings in their lives as well. So uh, it's uh, great to have the panel here. Great to have a, a huge crowd here, uh, which is again surprising for uh, any any subject that starts out with death. Um, <laughs> for those of you who have, um, let's see, sorry about that. Let's see, we don't usually run slides here, uh, or at least I don't usually run slides from from my my presentation. Um, and this is why. But we, we actually do our, uh, do our events a little bit differently here. Uh, I actually like to start out with Q&A at first, or actually what we're going to do is we're going to do the cues. Um, so I'm going to take from the audience a few questions that we'll use to kind of guide the conversation. Then I've got a few principles that I threw together based upon some of the conversations that we had uh, before this session. But we, we do want it to be uh, driven by what you guys need out of the panel. So I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves. I can introduce them, but they'll do it better themselves. As they're making their introductions, if you guys can think about questions that you might want the panel to talk about, then we'll have a more traditional Q&A at the end. But, um, and you don't need to read my writing, which you'll find out is, is absolutely atrocious. Um, also, if you if you like, you can follow us on because I'm going to erase this. You can follow us on Twitter at at, at workta, and our wireless info. The login is o guest, and the password is uh, it's Monday's date, so zero three eighteen thirteen. So Jeff, if you don't mind, uh, in, introduce yourself and uh, go down the line. Hi, I'm Jeff Date. Um, I'm a computer scientist originally, but I spent my career in semiconductors. I was ten years at AMD. Ended up as senior vice president running all the microprocessor groups, and I did a startup called Rambus uh, from me and two founders and ran that for 15 years. Retired for a couple of years, came back, ran a solar company for a couple of years, retired again. Now I'm uh, on several boards of directors. I'm Dan Levin, I'm the CEO at Box, um, and I've been around the Valley for about 25 years. Uh, founded a company that was uh, originally funded by Hummer Winblad in the 90s. Uh, was at Intuit for six and a half years where I ran all the small business products and services. And I've been at uh, Box for about two and a half years as an employee, and before that I was an advisor and board member for about a year. Hi, I'm Gary Swart. I'm the CEO of a company called Odesk, and we're the world's largest online workplace. We help companies to hire, manage, and pay talent in the cloud. Prior to Odesk, 
I had a little um, document management company, kind of like Box, only we didn't execute uh, nearly as well as they did. I like to refer to that as my character building experience. And prior to that, I was a little company called IBM, the, the acquisition of rational software. Hi, I'm Sharon Weinbar. I'm a partner at Scale Venture Partners. We invest in companies that are in the scaling phase, so early in revenue, growing very quickly. And we're pleased to have uh, invested in Box a couple of years ago. Um, I have two sort of past lives. One is five years at Bain Company as a consultant, and then a long time in um, software companies. Started as a product manager, worked my way up to running marketing for a series of startups, including one like, public in the bubble. Hey, I'm Jules Maltz. I'm a partner at IVP. We're a late stage venture firm, similar to scale in terms of stage. Uh, we're a billion dollar fund uh, that we raised last year. Uh, investors in Twitter, Dropbox, Zynga, HomeAway, Kayak. Um, I'm on the board of uh, a company called Yext in New York and Retail Me Not in Austin, Texas. So I have no board me boards actually in the Bay Area, which I'm trying to fix. Um, and I used to be on the board of Buddy Media as well. So I um, actually kind of enjoy board meetings because I have a relatively light board load. I love how none of them ever brag about the cool companies they work with or anything like that. Um, so let me start with the questions. This is always the moment of truth. Will anyone raise their hand? So what, a, what does a, a positive, enjoyable, successful board meeting look like? And have you ever been to one? <laughs> I'll let you know when I find it. <laughs> Next. Do the uh, integrated package, package distribution just communicating before the, the board meeting? Do the integrated tools work, or is it just manual and get paper out at the last minute? I think I can recommend an integrated tool. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, uh, how does one exit a board, and uh, how do you actually manage board recruitment or over a period of time? <clears throat> Everybody says you have to be really careful choosing your board members. Now, given that you don't have 100 people pushing money at you, I, I want to know how do you <clears throat> actionable m methods for choosing board, choosing good board members? When board members are throwing out exciting ideas, what are some common responses to taming them down? <laughs> In fact, that one's so good, we may change the title for the next time we do this, How to Tame Your Board. <laughs> what are the strategic uh, issues and topics that come up during the different phases of growth and like challenges? Because you know, it clearly the companies mature over time and, and be public, so like, you know, still in product development phase. What stage does the board uh, get to the point where it's considered too big? What strategies lead to a productive board view? When do you decide to change a board member? Okay. Well, I think that's kind of. Um, I like advice on how much operational detail to share, uh, share during board meetings versus strategic decisions. Uh, and what's the balance? <coughs> How do you avoid or mediate a board fight when the first VC has reached its end of fund and they want to cash out, sell the company, when the second VC got a deep pocket and they want to keep it and grow it until I pay Very carefully. That's <laughs> 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 yeah. way to approach replacing your chairman. Very 
Okay. says 90% of CEOs under focus and 10% over focus and neither is good and I think it's important that you recognize which one of those you are I'm an under focus yeah I have lots of ideas I want to do them all and so we had to find a board member who was very very strategic a ruthless prioritizer and so knowing that I had that as a weakness we found a board member who has that as a strength Thomas Layton formerly of open table is unbelievably good at picking the one thing that matters and then focusing on that and then going to the next thing. So that turned out to be a pivotal, pivotal moment in our company bringing somebody with that strength. Uh, the other thing I want to amplify is, uh, is what Dan said, is that if you think about uh, making any hire, the first thing that matters to me is personal characteristics, the second is motivation, third is skill and knowledge. Because the personal characteristics are things you can't change. Uh, I had a boss 
who said you could teach a chicken to climb a tree, but you're better off getting a squirrel in the first place. So find yourself a squirrel. If you know what the personal characteristics are that are important to you, don't take somebody if they're not smart, trustworthy, creative, strategic. What are the, what are the strengths that you can't teach them that they have to possess? And then second is motivation. What is it that they want to do? Why do they want to be on their board? Do they just want the money? Do they want? Do they love your business and what you're doing and just want to be part of it? Or uh, do they? Uh, you know, have they been a public CEO and now they really just want to participate and give back and mentor and they like you and 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 what you're doing, right? So I think the personal characteristics and the motivation are more important than they were. They have this specific skill or this knowledge. Maybe I'll just, from the investor perspective, give some advice on, you know, assuming that you can raise money and you have a choice of firms, how do you, how do you go about picking? The, we expect the CEOs that we're backing to do due diligence on us just as we do due diligence on you. So we think it's really important that you know who you're going to be working with. So in fact, so if, if, and if, if you act as a kind of isolated atom and you're not connected to the entrepreneurial community and the rest of the venture community, we're going to worry about you as a potential investment. So we like seeing that you are checking us out because, it should, that, because that's a good survivor gene uh, expression. So um, we expect uh, prospective CEOs to call references on us. And what you should be looking for is a couple things. One, so you, you're picking both the firm and the person. And remember, when you take money, the firm buys a seat at the table, a perpetual seat at the table that you cannot get rid of until you change the docs sometime later. And we have a right to that, we have a right to that seat until we get backed into a corner and we lose that right to that seat because we have to trade it away for something else. So, um, so it's, but it's the firm that has the right, so, and then the firm names a person to the board. So you're trying to get, you have to be thinking about both the firm and the individual board member. At the firm level, you're looking for, does this, does this investor group have experience with my market space, business model, stage of company? So for example, one of my portfolio companies, very high growth company, went from kind of early stage to quite late stage relatively quickly. A firm that had seen it earlier wanted to do a later stage round in that company. In their due diligence process, this was so bizarre, they never asked for financials. Like they talked a lot about vision, strategy, they all the kind of things you look, you ask about in an early stage company. They never once asked for the spreadsheet. And you go, How? but you know, we have a lot of issues that are centered on the spreadsheet. How do you scale enterprise sales? How much should you be spending on sales and marketing? All that kind of stuff. And when that person gave us a term sheet, even though it was a really name brand firm, we turned it down because we thought that they didn't, they didn't even know how to ask the questions about our phase in the company, much less did we expect that then they would know what to do if they didn't know how to ask, ask the questions. So you think about the firm and then the person, and, and the person, it's a lot of the same kinds of issues that these guys mentioned. Yeah, I would just add real quick, um, I think it's just about uh, attracting a complementary set of people. And where I think the CEO can be most influential is really picking the independent director. So I, I always love being on a board when there's uh, the CEO has a, a mentor, someone who's essentially done what the CEO is trying to accomplish before. And I think with, with OpenTable, that's a huge, uh, with OpenTable CEO and Odesk, that's a huge uh, compliment there. I'm on the board of Yext. Um, the chairman of Yext is a guy, Michael Walrath, who was the CEO of Right Media. It was one of the largest exits in New York, uh, sold to Yahoo for over $800 million. So Yext is trying to be a next generation software company in New York. We've got the, the person who's essentially done that or, or built a very large media and, and uh, advertising business in New York, mentoring the CEO. He's 10 years older than the CEO. They almost, they're starting to look alike, which is really scaring me. But um, uh, I think it's really helpful. So with venture investors, there's actually probably less dispersion between venture folks. We actually probably do think quite similar around issues, so you want to be careful about limiting the number of venture investors. The, my favorite quote around that is that venture investor board members are like martinis. Um, one's good, two might be a little better, but once you start going three, four, five, you're, that's not good. So um, try, to, try to limit it to two. I think that's the right number for venture investors. Gary, is there a perfect size for a board, or does it change and you never know? Well, 
you know, one of the questions I was thinking about, there's, uh, you know, at different stages, you know, I think of a company, uh, company's life cycle, cycle along the lines of jungle, dirt road, highway. And in the jungle, you know, what tools do you need and techniques and tactics in order to get out of the jungle onto the dirt road, and then you no longer need machetes, you need a Jeep, and then you need an Audi or whatever's going to get you on the highway. And so, um, I'm not endorsing Audi, just saying it's the car that came to mind begins with A. Um, no, you will be coming so, after you later. So I, I think, um, you know, it really depends on what you need, right? But, you know, there was another question about how many board members is too many, and I was thinking, well, that could be one additional in addition to you. One could be too many if you have the wrong person. Um, we, we have seven, and I think that's a good number. Odd number is good. Break a tie in any kind of vote, but... Uh, Right. Partly it's related to when you have to build committees and how hard your existing investors are willing to work doubling, especially as you scale toward IPO, there's a lot of committee work. So if you have a small board that's willing to double up on audit, non, comp committee, where there is a lot of work at that phase, then you can have a relatively small board. I think five is technically the minimum you can and have enough people to staff all the committees and, and the right number of independents. But, but usually people don't want to be on both audit and compensation committee, for example, because they're both a lot of work. And so that's where you end up with getting, getting toward the seven is kind of optimal at the, at the preparing for IPO stage. But I would say five to start. Early in your company's career, smaller is better. Because every time you need to get something done, you're going to need to get everybody to sign a piece of paper. It's harder to get a large group of people together. And don't confuse your board from your advisors. That's a really important thing. You're allowed to have advisors who are not on your board. So I, I recommend the smallest practical board early in a company's life. It, that raises an interesting question because there's, there's also in between. There are the observers. There, there, there are folks that don't get to sit at the big table, but they get to be in the room. Uh, and I know some venture funds have uh, almost a religious bias against observers. Uh, Sharon, Jules, I know, what's, what's your sense of having observers in the room? Good, bad, indifferent, depends. Well, I mean, it's another person in the room, so they have to be additive to the room. So we, we're pretty flexible on whether we're, we're a board member or board observer, but regardless, if we're in the room, we're active and helpful to the company. Um, so I think it's about making sure the, the right uh, people are in the room. You know, typically as an observer, you don't need them to, to be on the committees or they're not, you know, if there's something that's uh, for, for voting purposes, they're not, they don't have a vote. And so it can be helpful to, to constrain the board, but then still get the help from the observers uh, outside the room. But I'd, I'd really make sure that, you know, you don't have three, four, five observers. It really should be maybe an additional one or two people. Yeah, I mean, a lot of firms, especially when the company is successful, Everybody in a firm wants to glom onto the successful company, and so you find all the junior people or another partner wanting to come to the meeting, and those people, you know, should explicitly not sit at the table, not speak, and there comes a point where there's just too much going on in the company, and and they need to be disinvited, and that's always a little bit sticky issue. But you have to, at some point, you just have to stop having all the grandstand looking down on the board meeting. Is it all? It, it introduces other risk of data leakage and things like that. And then again, as you get into any kind of sticky topic, there's a there is an attorney-client privilege that happens between the lawyers and the actual board members that doesn't extend to non-board members, and you have to disinvite those people. Yeah, I think uh, we had that situation where one of our board members started bringing. There's this flight to activity, right? Things are good, and they want to glom on. And um, the decision should be yours. To, to end it, and I think the best way to end it is before it starts, right? Just the, the, unless it's accretive, unless you decide, hey, we need this incremental guidance on a strategic topic, you, you should not allow it. Yeah, but, and the, the, the trick is that a lot of, like our docs, our standard docs, allow us to bring an observer to every meeting and every committee meeting, but, the, but we don't exercise that right all the time, and so, and that's where the CEO has to be able to have a fluid conversation with the investor board member about the dynamics of the board meeting and what the, what's best for the company at that stage. So, so keep it simple, don't ever agree to observers. I think they're just completely useless. Uh, so don't agree to them in your docs when you invest, would be my, my suggestion. Okay, can I give the counterpoint to that? Because we've got, um, 
every venture firm in the Valley except for IVP, apparently, as an observer. Um, I mean, I'll come if you invite me. So Literally, we must, we must have 20 people in the room. We, we do two halves of our board meetings, the big half and the little half, and the big half has got like 20 people in the room. And it's very useful under two conditions. One, observers do not speak. And two, observers do useful work for me or they don't get to come to my board meeting. So when I'm trying to recruit somebody, when I want to go to London, I expect my observers to work on my behalf, to introduce me to people, to suggest law firms that they've worked with in the past, to recommend recruiters, uh, to introduce me to executives that they may have relationships with that can help out my company. And when they're in the room, I expect them not to speak unless spoken to or unless they've got some really monumental piece of, of news to share. Do you tell them that? <laughs> um, or do you just pick people who get it intuitively? Well, one, one can't always pick, as, as we've discussed. Um, but I, I give feedback to people who I think are not honoring. Look, anybody who walks into a room of 20 people, you know, 12 of whom are observ observers, and starts asking questions and mouthing off in the board meeting, is not tuned into reality. Because obviously, if all 12 observers did that, the meeting would be 20 hours long. So. I don't have any problem sitting down with them after the meeting and saying, hey, look, we're really delighted you're here. We appreciate your firm's involvement with Box. We, we really see value in our relationship with you. But as you can probably figure out, if every observer was to be as involved in the board meeting as you seem to want to be, then we're never going to get anything done. And I'd appreciate it if you could try to limit your comments to situations where you really feel you have something monumental to add. And I'll be happy to have breakfast with you offline or you know, have a phone call with you offline to give you an opportunity to react and, and comment. The, the one technical comment I'd make is that for a, most of the venture funds that you'll run into in the Valley, there are technical reasons that they have to have the right to appoint an observer to the board if they're not serving as a director. But as Sharon said, most of the time they don't bring one, they don't exercise that right, but there are, there are requirements under, under, uh, under law that they have to have the right to designate one. But rarely do you, do you see them exercise that. This is my favorite one because I get, periodically I get this call after a board meeting from a CEO saying, what the just happened? And nine times out of 10, it's because something came up and at least one of the board members didn't know what it, what it was. How, Jules, it, what's a surprise that, that you should never have happen to you? Can I just say before Jules answers this, this is an abstraction of the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not surprise thine boss. <laughs> it just happens in this context that your boss is your boy. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be, we lost a major customer, the CFO just resigned, uh, you know, there's a major lawsuit. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that's material that, um, you know, or even, you know, we're about to do an acquisition that's, you know, uh, you know, a huge, uh, huge acquisition, and I need approval for it. Um, op even option grants—I mean, they seem small, but if you start, if you're thinking all of a sudden we're going to give someone two percent of the company, that it's really unusual. Um, all of a sudden, you've delayed. I mean, option grants should be a formality, and those should be covered at the beginning of a meeting. They shouldn't be. There shouldn't be anything unusual in those. So send the materials in advance. That won't happen. But if there's something that's really big news, tell us immediately and, and do it either in person or on a phone call. Um, the best CEOs actually have phone calls or they're checking in regularly with, with board members so that there really shouldn't be any surprises. Gary, it, it, it sounds like a small point, but when, do you, when does your company send out board decks? Uh, we aim to do it a week in advance. We probably do it four days in advance. Um, anything shorter than that is, is cutting it close. Uh, you know, and along the lines of board materials, we, uh, you, we, we've standardized on a package that we've gotten feedback from our board, what they want to see. And this operational update, um, it, it's really the way that we run our business. So we're not creating any additional materials for the board. We've made it part of our business. Like, hey, this is the way we report on our business, and how can we tweak it to make sure we're giving you everything that you want, so we don't have to do a big giant dog and pony uh, before the, the board meeting. We've tried to make it a uh, very, very low overhead to get that package out. Right? Dan, you were saying that your board meetings are 
six hours long, and you've got a cast of thousands that, that are there. And you, you mentioned you've got the, the big half and the, and the, and the, the smaller group afterwards. Do you also do the sessions in between formal board meetings? Do you, obviously, you're talking to your board meetings, board members a bunch, but do you do kind of not formal board meetings, but formal group calls or update calls? Yes. We, when we were doing monthly board meetings, we didn't. When we moved away from doing monthly board meetings, uh, where the monthly board meetings used to be, we do a board call. And I would just build on, on the comment here, which I totally agree with. Your ops review is the place where stuff gets created because that's where you run the business. Your stuff from the ops review that ends up at the board meeting, you should not have to create anything new from your board and you should be totally upfront with them. I'm not gonna create anything new for you. That means some of these slides are not gonna be beautiful because they're the slides I use to run the business, but you want me spending my time running this company and building shareholder value not making every slide for the board meeting beautiful. Yeah, and can I say, the, to me, one of my least favorite ways for my portfolio companies to spend time, and it was my least favorite way when I was an executive in startups, is the department by department quarterly update that kind of reads as like what I, you know, what I did on my summer vacation. And, and because not every, with all due respect to all the VPs in the world, not every department has to talk at every board meeting. It's just not, it, it, it's not critical. And so the board meeting should cycle through what's a critical thing for the board to understand about the company and the company to get feedback from the board. But it, that doesn't mean that, that each, that you have to go through this rote process every single period. Yeah, I'll stick with you for a second. In a board deck, what do you think should be there? What do you expect to see in a board deck? Yeah, so there's there's a couple different things. You're looking for financials. So what financials, and to me, financials should always come in context. So you're looking at what is the current period financials and what is the sort of running history coming into that period. So if you're looking at this quarter, what's the trailing four quarters? What's this quarter? How do we do actual versus plan? The MDNA of why there's variance, which doesn't mean that the CFO should sit there and read the MDNA. This is why it's really important to send the board materials early so everybody knows what the results were and why the results were so that you can talk about in the board meeting what is the forecast, why, and what are we going to do about that, whether it's revising the forecast up or down. You want to talk about the, the sort of the forward-leaning things, not the facts of what are trailing. So there's all that financial stuff, which is in instrumenting your business. Then there's the what, are the, what are the key issues the company is working on? And you know, the, all of us in management have that construct of, you know, there's the urgent and the important, and you know, part of it you have to talk about the urgent and important, but you have to make sure that you spend time on the important and in the moment not urgent, but if you don't get to it pretty soon, uh, you might have missed the window. So, and that's where, that's the strategic planning part of the company, and that's what, that's what your board is really there to help guide you on. Where are we going in the, where is our market and the opportunity? Where are we going? What's our skills gap to get there? What's our capital gap to get there? And how, how are we tracking on that? What, you know, what's going to make value for the company? And then you have a lot of administrative stuff that should take about 10 minutes, which is things like you know, higher, um, options grants and other things that the board officially has to vote on. But that's a, that's a small part of the board. <laughs> Jeff, bad things happen. They may never have happened in your experience, but, but bad things generally happen. How do you tell a board member that something has gone wrong? What do you, what do, you do? Well, you know, my, my staff would sometimes say, well, you know, what should we tell the board? And the answer is you should tell them the truth. So when something bad happens, if one of the first things you should do after immediate damage control to make sure the plane doesn't crash is pick up the phone and call the board members and tell them what happened. You know, don't wait until you know why it happened. Go until you have everything figured out. The quicker you communicate, the better, and just tell them what you know. And be upfront and honest about it. Uh, as soon as you, they start to figure that you're delaying and hiding, that's that's death. You're losing trust. Yeah, I mean, we expect to get an email or a phone call on the first day of the next quarter from almost everybody. You know, just a flash. It went well. It didn't go well. Something. You know, I thought a bunch of big deals were going to come in last night, and they didn't. So bad news, bad news should come way faster than good news. 
And most, most CEOs tend to communicate the good news. <laughs> and the absence of news usually means something bad is happening. <laughs> I had a real positive experience. Somebody, I mean, it wasn't positive for the company, but there was a, a large uh, three to four million dollar client that canceled for one of my companies. And uh, this was a few years ago. And um, uh, you know, I got an email from the CEO, and, and the C uh, got the head of sales was devastated because it was a client that this person had worked on really, um, you know, for such a long time. And it was actually positive because, you know, the next day, you know, this was someone we really wanted to keep in the company, the, the head of sales, and and so I called the head of sales after talking to the CEO and just give, gave him a pep talk. And this is before the board meeting, just saying, you know, you're great. We're going to get them back. We've actually since gotten that customer back. At, you know, so it's it's something that the board really wants to be there for the good times and the bad, and we really want to try to be helpful to the company. The board, you know, I, I could play a really good role in, in trying to keep the, the head of sales motivated during that situation. So it was actually helpful for me to know that bad news rather than to have this person stew on why I lost the, the deal, and, and they're probably now worried about maybe the board wanting to fire the head of sales. It, it actually almost turned things around in a really positive way. So early on at uh, Odesk, I if you think about the sections that you talked about, I think about it as progress. What progress have we made against what we said we were going to do? I think about it as priorities. What are we going to do next? What are we prioritizing and what sh you should expect to see next or what are we working on? And then problems. What problems are we facing? What uh, big decisions do we have to make? And early on in our board meetings, we spent more time on progress and priorities than we did on problems. We raised the problems, but we really wouldn't really discuss them. We didn't know that that's what the board meeting was really for. And I would say now we spend much more time on problems or you know hard decisions, things where you really could get the value out of the board. And the evidence for me was you know some of our very best board members would go to their BlackBerry when you, when somebody's coming in to talk about. Let me tell you about. Um, I don't want to pick on anybody. Let me tell you about product. It's like. They don't want to hear about pride. They want to hear about you know what can we where can we add value. They want to solve hard problems. They want to you know dig into something meaty. And so our board meetings are not operational updates. Um, the operational update goes out in the board pack, and we spend about 11 seconds on it. Here's the numbers. Here's what we said we're going to. Here's what we're going to do. Now, if there's a problem there, we might dig into the why, right? But uh, but it's much more focused on where do we need help? Where where are the opportunities we should capitalize on? much more weighted towards that. One of the other, the, the less common causes uh, of the what the blank call is, is, in my experience, there's been some internal inconsistency among management. You've, you've got a bunch of management in the, in the room and they're, they're not necessarily on the same page. How do you guys, and I'll, I'll open it to everybody, on the, on the management side, how do you prepare your team for a board meeting? What do you, what do, you do logistically walking, walking through the, the couple of days or the days leading up to the board meeting, get them ready, make sure everybody's on the same page? Not everybody was born to do board meetings, so it's, tactical advice is helpful there. I think the, um, you know, I don't think I'd agree with this. Practice, practice, practice. It makes it sound like you have three dry runs of your board meeting. So I, I would never do that. Um, you know, you should run. I agree with these guys that when you have a board, I hate it when the CEO say the board meeting's so much work. I got to do all this work for the board. You know, in running the company, you should be doing this kind of stuff in the first place. So there shouldn't be a lot of work to have the board meeting. And the board members really don't care if the slides look beautiful. They just want them to make sense and be, be readable. So I think at board, the most important thing to focus on is what are the biggest you know, problems, the flip side of problems is challenges and opportunities that you have to address. And you should really uh, prioritize and think about what, are, what am I trying to get done at this board meeting and have a session with your team you know, one or two weeks ahead of time and so say what are the critical issues that are facing us that we most could use input from the board on or that we need to get their backing to, to approve and then assign people to, oh, you, you're going to present this one, you're going to present that one, you're going to pull together this one. Don't do it functionally. You know, all these decisions usually involve several functions, but get somebody to pull it together and say, okay, you're going to address issue number one, you're going to address issue number two, and you know, trust them to send out the information, and you, you usually don't have to do a lot of review if you've got a good team and you're running the company right. Uh, this is a very complicated topic. I've got a lot of thoughts going through my head. 
One is it's really important to know whether you have a board that is cohesive and communicating well and has a high, high level of trust or not. So my behavior when I have a new board member at the table is very different than if I don't. Uh, so that's one thing, one dimension to think about. The other dimension to think about is I am the custodian of the careers of my leadership team. And their opportunity to present in front of what at Box is an unbelievably important group of people in the Valley, that is a high leverage moment in their career. Uh, they're not going to do that all the time. And they're going to be remembered for how they do it. So I don't do a dry run with them, but I absolutely review their slides. I coach them after every presentation on what I think they did well and what I would like them to do differently so that they can do better next time. And I try very hard to put people in a position to be successful. So if somebody's going to take the bullet, it's going to be me. If somebody's going to take the credit, it's going to be my sales leader or my engineering leader. Um, that's probably enough for right now. I could go for hours. Yeah, can I, I mean, I think that's a really important point for the CEOs is the making sure that you let, yes, let the VPs talk and give them a platform, but also give them air cover. I mean, to me, so as an investor, this is the bubble over my head when what I'm, what I'm thinking about as the various parts of the management team are presenting. How are these people operating together, right? So I'm looking at a lot of nonverbal cues. Who's paying attention to who's talking? Who's sitting there with a scowl on their face or looking like a stink bomb just came because they don't agree with the strategy that the other person is proposing? Who's sitting in the back of the room like this? I was in a board meeting yesterday where I was watching all those things because we have a new head of product and it's sort of who's bought into the new strategy and the new team and who's not. Those are really important. So, so that's, you know, that's what your investors are watching because what we really care about from the CEO is, can you, you know, are you making the right strategic decisions? Are you raising the money when you need it? And do you have the right team? Because it's the team that's doing the work, not the CEO. So it's a real danger signal when the CEO is the only person who talks at a board meeting. Um, and it's a real danger signal when the, when the other people talk and either the CEO hangs them out to dry when the board disagrees with them, or when there's, when there's apparent discord even that's not spoken. And it's a great moment when everybody is there together. I mean, you know, the, the, the hope, the good situation, which is the majority of the situation, is people are charged up together and their body language is saying that <coughs> as much as what the slides are saying. <clears throat> this, um, after doing this for a bunch of years, it seems natural now, but it wasn't at first. My tendency early on was to put everything in the window. I want to show the board what a great job we're doing and look at all this information. I want to give everybody a chance to speak and we just got the most kick-ass marketer and I, I want to showcase that person and you know, over time you realize that less is more. So it shouldn't be a big dog and pony. It shouldn't be practice, practice, practice. But if you are going to put somebody in front of the board, you do want to set them up for success. And my guidance there is that less is more. What they think, what uh, I've learned that you have to have a filter on the information. So what you think is important, the board probably doesn't. So you got to cut that by 40%. And then what they think is important, you got to cut by 140%. I mean, you got to really whittle it down or you're going to set them up for failure because the board's going to glaze over, go to their blackberries, and you're not actually going to motivate them. They're going to walk out saying, oh, they didn't even pay attention to me. They didn't care. They yeah. didn't care. So you, you, you have to focus on the difference that makes a difference. and help them to have a filter. Like if somebody's coming in, it's two slides. No more than that. Like anything more than that, you're going to lose them. So. Well, one thing I would just add very briefly is a kind word said in front of an audience is worth a hundred kind words said in private. So if you want to say something great about one of your leaders and they deserve it, do it in the board meeting if you have the opportunity. That was a great comment, Dan. I was about to say that. So. <laughs> And on the flip, and on the flip side, chew them, them out in private. Don't be them in front of the board. Jules, what's it, what is appropriate for a CEO to expect you to walk into a board meeting having done? Read 100% of the slides. If they're, sent, if they're sent four days in advance, you better read the slides. We had one, one of our CEOs also thought it would be actually be helpful just to, he's a really good writer, so he wrote, um, this is that Mike Lazaro uh, from Buddy Media, he was a journalism major, so he wrote like a five page letter before the board meeting, just talking about, I mean, he, it only took him about half an hour, but uh, just running out all the strategic issues of the business, and he said, anyone who asks a question 
that was in my letter at the board meeting can't talk the rest of the time. <laughs> so someone almost did, but it was uh, it was so. I, I think it's it's if you can send it out in advance, um, a board member should should read everything. And I actually like when the CEOs tell us what they want from us during the meeting. So you know we we do a lot of IPOs and M and A events. We had one CEO say, "Hey, I'm thinking about you know this M and A event." I want you guys, I'm gonna call on you in the board meeting, and I want you to have thought about it. And so that it's actually a little bit of homework for us, and, and we like that. It makes, uh, it makes me come to the board meeting not sitting back wondering, well, did they hit their numbers, financials, but it comes, uh, I come to the board meeting now leaning forward saying, okay, I'm gonna be ready for, for my time and where I can contribute to the board. I think your directors also owe it to the CEO to say if you have an issue, a disagreement, a major question about what's in the board pack, that you ventilate that to the team before you get there so that they can be prepared. There's no, just like the, the you got, you got shouldn't surprise us, we shouldn't come, you know, s swords blazing to the meeting without you being prepared for that. So, you know, so it, if, a, if a company is proposing a strategic decision or proposing a major, hiring change or something like that, and I have an issue with that, I call the CEO and say, I just want to let you know, this is, you know, this, how are you thinking about this issue? This is how I'm thinking about that issue. I might be on the same page with you, you know, we're gonna have a discussion at the board meeting, see how everybody else feels, but I just want you to know, I, I'm, I'm not fully bought into this proposal yet. Dan, how often do you talk to your board members outside of the actual board meeting and update calls? Okay, I have to say we cheat, right? So we've got Aaron, Dylan, and myself. We all sit on the board. We all interact with the board members. So we split the work up three ways. Um, but regularly, I probably have, I, my tool is breakfast because I drop my kid in Woodside at 7 o'clock in the morning. So bucks at 7.15 or something like that. Uh, I probably see everybody once a quarter in that kind of informal setting and maybe talk to them now, I probably see him once a quarter, and then Aaron and Dylan talk to him or see him in some other context as well. I think the uh, analogy of jungle, dirt road, <clears throat> highway is good because as you get further down that path, frequency can go down because things are getting hopefully smoother and more straightforward. But earlier on, when you're in the jungle phase, probably once a month is very important at a minimum to be face to face with your board members, one on ones or in board meetings. So I'm interested in, in your feedback on what I tell my clients. I tell my clients that if there's anything complicated or challenging or difficult or a problem, that you know exactly what each board member is going to answer before, long before you walk into the board meeting. So the, by the time you get into the board meeting, unless it's an epic issue uh, that requires a big strategy discussion among the board members, there's nothing really. There's nothing really to discuss. Is that fair? Uh, there's almost always something you need to discuss, but uh, you you want to um, lay the groundwork for the decision before the board meeting. Ideally, uh, in, I can't think of a case where you wouldn't. Uh, you want to sort of start to get people channeled in a direction. Uh, you still have to have a board meeting, have discussion. People have questions. They want to hear the team. But part of making your VP successful in their presentations is sort of to help set the stage with the board members in advance of that decision. So they come in kind of thinking in the, hopefully the right direction. I, I always suggest to, to companies who ask, you know, the, the board meeting is, is intended to, to think about the, the big picture, and you guys have touched on this a number of times, but where do you draw the line between operational and strategic, and how do you how do you weight the discussion, and how do you how do you ask for advice, and maybe tell them to stop giving advice? Dan, it's all over the map. I mean, certainly when it comes to matters of information presentation. It's not uncommon for us to talk about incredibly tactical things in the board meeting, like should this be done in a dollar-weighted or unit-weighted basis, or what's the right way to present this trend over time, or something like that. We don't talk about anything about the way the business runs with the board unless they have a strong interest for some reason. So, you know, 
when we have staff meetings or how long they are or how we do our annual focal review process or anything like that. The conversations with, with our board, and, and this has been my experience in most sort of later stage situations, um, you're talking about the big strate strategic stuff almost completely. When it was me, my partner, and John Hummer sitting around a table and we had 10 employees, we talked about all kinds of operational stuff. I mean, he's a financial guru and there were a lot of complicated problems that we needed help with. So I, I, I like the, uh, what is it, the jungle, the dirt road, and the highway yeah. analogy. I mean, I think the altitude of your board conversations tends to change over time in the direction of being higher altitude. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think that um, I, I send out an operational update after every month. It's just a paragraph or two, here's how we did, here's what we said we were going to do, here's where we go. There's more detail below if you want more detail. Uh, it's not the board pack, it's just a quick operational update. And sometimes in the board pack, we'll, I used to say, is there anything that you'd want to add? But what would happen is people would say, yeah, please add this, this, and this, and we don't want to talk about that. And if you give your board the opportunity to ask questions or to go deep on a topic, they'll go deep on a topic. Not all board members, some people will check out. And one of my signs is one of our very strategic board members, if he gets up to go to the bathroom, one, he either had a lot of coffee, or two, we're boring him. We're getting way too deep on something that is just, we shouldn't be talking about. And it took me a while to realize this. We have one board member that'll say, um, I want to talk about this detail. Should that be red or blue? And it's like, uh, this is the wrong forum for that. And so I think that you have to keep it at the right level for everybody in the room, because I think it gets aggravating for the others when you start going to uh, deep on something. Yeah. Can I? Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I think a lot of people forget that the board is not running the company. It's not, a, it's not an actual management or executive meeting. There shouldn't be decisions, should be, be red or blue. Discuss, folks. You know, you don't, that's not the purpose of the board. That really all the board functionally does is the board hires and fires the CEO. That's the key part of what a board needs to do. And then we need to approve options and other legal stuff. And I think other than that, I don't think there's a lot of other requirements that the board has to do. So we want to be updated and understand your business and help provide strategic advice, but we want to hear your decisions. Tell us that you're doing this, and we can ask questions around it and be helpful, but I really hate it when somebody says, we, we can't decide, you know, why don't we try to solve it in the board meeting? Unless it's really should we sell the company or not, it's, it shouldn't be a, a board discussion if, you know, how we should report on this, this metric. So let me, just to offer a slightly different perspective, you guys have companies that are operating at peak performance. I mean, these are top decile companies in the Valley. So, so that's, this is the optimal experience is, is getting on the highway and having a board that's very focused on that very high level strategic thinking. For most companies, operational excellence is the first priority, first strategic priority. And that, you know, so and that's a little bit of strategy mixed with operation because you're trying to get that early product market fit. You're trying to get the right sales channel working, the right pricing strategy. So there's a lot of things that are in the in the intersection of operational and strategic. And meanwhile, while you haven't yet crossed over from operational to strategic, you're burning a lot of cash usually. And so that's what the board, so the board does, I'm going to say, this is something different than what you guys said, the board cares a lot about a lot of the operational details in those kind of moments, which sometimes they're brief moments before you get to, you know, before you get onto the road. And sometimes a company can linger there for a long time. And by the way, sometimes you can regress to the jungle. I had a portfolio company had some really severe issues. Last December, I had a portfolio company that had a board meeting every single day of December, including Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and New Year's Eve. Uh, and actually, it's doing incredibly well now, but we almost ran out of cash, and we had a board meeting every day about what are we going to do about that. So, so the, while this is the ideal to aspire to, you know, if your company has not yet got product flying off the shelf, you should have a different experience of what your interaction with your directors is going to be. And in particular, your investors who are mind, you know, trying to figure out what am I doing with this money? How much runway do we have? What's the next, are we going to get to a milestone on this cash? Do I want to put more cash in? I mean, there's all those kind of questions that are coming up every quarter. How am I going to communicate what's going on with this company to the rest of my partnership? 
because are they going to, even if I want to put more money in, are they going to want to put more money in? Remember, it's a partnership vote. The, the board member doesn't have a say on it. So, I mean, has a say, but that can't unilaterally decide usually. So, you know, I think that's the state that most companies are in for a decent period of time. Can I just add one other thing? My classmate, Dave Hitz, who founded Network Appliance, wrote a great book called How to Castrate a Bull, which I encourage you all to read. Um, he actually does explain how to castrate a bull in the book, although that's not the focus. But there's a really interesting tidbit in there, which is he describes the CEO of NetApp's mindset. And he describes it as a simple do loop. Do I have confidence in this leader, yes or no? If yes, move Keep on. Going. If no, fire that person and get somebody new. So here's the thing you've got to remember. Your board's confidence in you as a leader and a leadership team is paramount to the good functioning of your relationship with them. And every contact you have with them is either accretive or dilutive to their confidence in you as a leader and in your team. So sometimes they will ask tough operational questions, detailed questions, because they're trying to decide whether they have confidence in you or not. And you can't push back on them and say, that's not strategic, we're not supposed to be talking about that. So you've got to be sensitive to that, and you've got to be really sensitive to this confidence thing, which I think is, is absolutely key. Then what do you do if you just fundamentally disagree with their analysis of something? Not a question of whether it's strategic or operational, but just fundamentally you think they're wrong. How do you how do you nobody, nobody loses confidence in you because you disagree with them. If you're rational and smart and thoughtful and can defend your position. They lose confidence in you because they don't think you're on the ball. They don't think you really know what's going on. They don't think you fire people that need to be fired. Something like that. So, I, I mean, I'm totally with Jeff on this one. The truth is, is the only way to deal with this stuff. If you disagree with a board member, just say, I disagree with you, but be prepared to defend your position and be rational and thoughtful about it. It's actually worse if you if you ask us what what we think or they you actually defer to the board. So once the CEO starts deferring to the board for major decisions, it's it's not the right CEO. Your your job as CEO is to uh, listen to the advice and suggestions of your board, think about it, and then do the right thing, even if it's completely <coughs> opposite from what the board thinks you should do, because you're the one running the company, you're the one there every day, and hopefully you're the one who knows way more than they do. And then they'll measure you on results. So if you disagree with the board, you want to make sure you're doing the right thing. But if you're, if you're trying to run the company by doing what the board tells you, it's like driving, looking at the rear view mirror. It's not going to work. This is one, we've touched on a lot of, a lot of the issues about how operationally I to run the meeting. But so I use this to catch all the catch some of the, the few really good questions. When you as the CEO, think it's time for a board member to go. And obviously, we talked about you know, the, the, a venture fund obviously has a say in it. But it, how, do you, how do you manage that if the, if the, the board relationship has become dysfunctional? One, how do you decide that it's become dysfunctional and, and, and it's not you? Um, and, and two, how do, you, how do you manage that process? You, you want to avoid getting in that place in the first place <laughs> because it's very difficult to, to get somebody off your board, even if they're an independent uh, board member. Um, so it, it just goes back to get the right board members in the first place. Uh, if you really do have a problem with the board members that dysfunctional, or presumably other board members would see it and agree, and uh, somehow at some point you have to have an open discussion with the board, probably with that board member there, and, and talk about it. Um, there's no easy way to do it. Well, I'll say, I mean, practically, so it, so it, you can, so yes, having the board members do the work so that it's a peer thing, not this, not from the CEO is, I would say, a best practice. And in, in a more mature company, you're going to have a nominating committee and the chairman of that who's in charge of recruiting um, new board members and staffing the committees and things like that, or you'll have a lead director who's different than the CEO, and so that person is actually has the job of trying to take over these kind of, take on these kinds of issues. When it's a venture, uh, when it's a venture board member, 
you have to think really hard about trying to make a change there. And I would say if the person who's causing, I have a company that has this issue, the person, we have a really disruptive board member from a venture fund. The issue is he also runs that venture fund. And we have gone, you know, and the other directors on that company have gone to that fund. And luckily the person travels a lot, so he's not always available. So he doesn't come to that many meetings. And when he comes, he doesn't know what's up. And he's disruptive. And, but we've gone to that fund. We've asked the other partners, you know, we, we know them, we like them, you know, could, could you swap out this person for that person? But guess what? That guy runs that fund. He makes the decisions and he's keeping that seat. And we used up a lot of juice trying to make that happen. Uh, and it took about six months for the relationships to even heal to where the point you could have a rational discussion with this person. Uh, so, you know, think about, you, can you just, can you isolate the disruptor and all, if all the other directors are cognizant of what the issue is, then you can kind of put that person in a box, even though you can't get him or her off the board. If it's a more junior person, there's a, there's a greater likelihood that you might be able to swap out that director, but you gotta realize, I mean, that's a, that is going to war with that director. If you go over, the, over your VC partner's head to their firm and ask them to swap out someone, I, I mean, that's you're a, going to shoot that, the king, you is, better kill the king. Surprise. That, yes. I mean, this is another, this is another, the 12th commandment. If you're taking a headshot, make sure this a worry is. If you're taking a headshot, make sure that you get the person, right? Like, you never want to try to assassinate somebody and miss, and then have them angry like hornets coming after you. Seriously. So, so, and don't. In this case, it's so much easier to just look at his travel schedule and then plan the board meetings around uh, <laughs> Or do your diligence in the first place with people who will be honest with you because this person didn't suddenly become disruptive like last week when they joined your board. They've been doing this for a while. Yes. Yeah. I, I think an interesting time to switch up board members is also when you raise a new round of financing. So we always ask the CEOs, do you want to make any changes to your board? And we can actually be the bad guys. We can say, you know what, um, you've already got a few venture investors on the board. We're going to come in. We'll take a board seat. But that means that two of the Series A board members, you know, we're out of the jungle. We're on the highway now. It's probably time for them to do that. And if we need to have conversations directly with them, uh, we'll, we'll do that. It, it puts us in an awkward position because we're trying to, you know, it's usually we're trying to invest in the company, but then telling the board members they can't be part of that company we're, we're investing in. Deal, but, yeah, but we're that. willing to do that because it, the CEO and it, the CEO has to tell us this is what I want from you, and that's part of the service that that we provide. So, but I, I think the best way to do it before you assassinate them, I think it, it is appropriate. People don't like having difficult conversations, but just telling somebody, uh, you know, and I'd be happy to hear it if any of my CEOs told me. But just telling someone, you know what, here's what I'm thinking. We we've got complementary skill sets on the board. I still want you really involved. In fact. You know, we can still meet at, at Bucks for breakfast and things like that, but um, you're gonna make a ton of money because the company's gonna do well, but you're not the right person on the board. So I, I think it's appropriate to have that direct conversation with somebody. If they still won't get off, maybe that's when you do the, uh, the assassination. Right. Another thing that you can do sometimes, especially as the board matures, is ask, is the venture fund keeps its right to a seat, but you ask them to nominate an, an industry expert as an outside director, but sitting in a preferred seat. So they have absolute control over the seat. They can, they can vote their shares, take that person out, and put somebody back in if they want, so we have control. But, but the company benefits because they're going to get somebody who can be an audit committee chair or be uh, an industry expert or help guide the strategy. Just for context. How often have you guys seen a board approval where it actually came down to, say, a 4-1 or a 3-2 in the, in, in the valley? No. Never. No. I, I just wanted to make that point because I, I, I've seen it a handful of times and it's, it's always around very, very significant corporate transactions or litigation. And to be clear, there's a legal reason you don't want to actually have a 3-2 vote. It, it looks bad in the minutes if you have a 3-2 vote. So I think the reason there aren't 3-2 votes is because you don't want there to be. So usually the other two people unanimously agree. But there, there are tense moments, you know, whether to sell a company, um, hiring and firing the, the CEO. Uh, you know, it, it does really matter, um, you know, who, what the opinions of the other board members are around that. 
So it would, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's not unusual to see discussions where <laughs> there's pros and cons, but at the end, I've always seen it where people gravitate to the majority and form a consensus and back it. Right, because as Jewel said, I mean, it, the place where I've seen a real schism, the most often is moments of selling the company. This just happened to a friend of mine in a company where the, it's happened to two friends. Management um, thinks that, that it's the right time to sell the company. They go get an offer. It's a reasonable offer. They bring the offer back to the board and the investor board members vote no. We don't want to sell the company. We want to keep going. But you just had management tell you, we think it's time to fold the tent and go on with these other people. So now you basically have management that says, I don't want to go. Investors are saying, go forward. And it, it all that situation almost always requires new management. Because you, so then you, you know, the two vote members who voted for go selling aren't invited to play anymore because you've decided you don't want to do what management is telling you to do. Any case where as a director you're saying, no, I don't, I don't have confidence in you anymore, that's not the right answer, you owe it to yourself to change it. And that, you know, so that's a, just, that's a huge disruption, but it does happen. I, I'm curious, it's outside the scope of this session, but have you ever seen a company succeed where you've got management has said, we want to sell, and then you don't sell? I can think of a situation, I wasn't involved in the company, but one of our board members was where they didn't. He convinced them not to. They hung on for another year and sold for significantly more to a, a much, much better outcome. Yeah, I mean, that, de that yeah. definitely happens. But, but that's after a considered discussion and you get on the same page. Because in that situation, you have to have manage it's, management has to recommit to the go forward Plan, right, so they have to be on the same page, saying, "Yeah, no, we think instead of instead of taking this risk adjusted, it's better to go for that." If the dispute is between the investors or among the investors, where you just flat they they just don't agree on on the best course of action, we see this a lot around financing, where you have an early early investor and director, very different interests from the the late stage investors. What should the CEO do? Should the CEO <laughs> stay out of it and let let the cage match happen, or do they should should they intervene, pick sides? Uh, how, how do you handle that sort of a situation? What, what's best for the company? I mean, I, I think ultimately the CEO and board members are focused on. I mean, they're fiduciaries. They need to do what's best ultimately for the company. So you may have differences in shareholder. You know, the shareholders are, are different. The actual funds are different. They have to do what's best for the funds. But when you're a board member or when you're the CEO, I, you know, I, I really focus on what decision is, is best for the company and try to try to steer the ship that way, be the facilitator during that situation. And advocate their position. I think, uh, you know, as we talked about before, your skill as an advocator is to sell that idea. You have to stand up for what you believe in. And, you know, if you draw a two-by-two two and you say, um, don't commit, commit, uh, agree, don't agree. Those are sort of your four buckets. If we're in don't agree, don't commit, if we're down here, we haven't agreed yet and so we haven't committed to anything, that's the time to make your argument. But once you commit to something, whether you agree or you disagree, you've committed to that thing. So the time to argue your position is down here, not after you've committed to do it. Because anybody who says afterwards, ah, oh, I don't agree with it, but this is the way we're going, get off the bus. Right? And we've had a situation where we've had to kick people off the bus because we committed to something and a month later found out that they didn't actually agree, then you, you gotta go. Right? If you're not gonna get behind this and make it successful, your time to advocate for it was here. Now we're all in, the bus is going, you gotta get on that bus. Right, but to your question, the, the scenario that you painted has become much more prevalent because holding periods in companies have lengthened dramatically over the last 10 years and the turnover in venture funds has accelerated. And so you just have a, you have a lot more situations where early stage investors who might have been there from a long time ago don't have money anymore, really, or need to sell this company in order to raise their next fund, um, have very different incentives than the later stage investors. And I think it's the CEO's job to understand all of that to, and to get the board members to articulate their position and then to try to help figure out, is there a solution? Because often, money solves the problem. If the company wants to go forward and there are investors who want to keep going forward, 
sometimes having the early stage investors sell some of their position, whether they're selling it back to the company, selling it to the later stage investors, selling it to a secondary buyer. There are ways that you can take some of the pressure off the stakeholders such that they can let the company keep running in a way that's productive for everybody. I think Sharon makes a really important point, which I just want to reinforce. If you're an entrepreneurial CEO, it is incumbent on you to understand how the venture industry works. Understand how venture capital firms in the Valley are structured, motivated, what their limited partners uh, care about, how their firm has structured this particular fund, what kind of time frame they've committed to their LPs, because all those things are going to have an influence on you, and all those things need to be uh, in your mind as you're crafting your go-forward strategy, because you may want to facilitate a situation where there's a secondary transaction as part of a financing, and an early investor is given an opportunity for some liquidity, because that solves a problem for them, even if you could otherwise not care about it. But you care because your job is to make them happy and successful. right? And the other thing to remember is, you're going to be in this valley for a long time. I've been around for 25 years. I'm still going to the Hummer Winblad Christmas party. I raised $750,000 from them in 1991. It's a small valley. You build a reputation, and that reputation matters, and it matters for a long time. And if you have a reputation for understanding what your investors care about and helping them get their needs met, that's a very good thing, in my opinion. And there was a question from the audience about committees, and obviously this is different from an early stage versus a late stage company. Early stage companies tend not to have committees. Uh, how, how do you view committees? Is it, is it a technical issue? Do you have them for technical requirements or because you want to get your own compensation as the CEO approved? Um, or or are, they, are they useful from, a, from an operational standpoint? Well, you, if you're lucky enough to hit the highway and you're looking to go public, you'll be wanting to set up committees and get all that stuff in place well before you file for an IPO. But uh, when you're a smaller company, I think generally, in my experience, you don't use committees. There could be some cases where there's some specialized work that is only requiring the skill sets or the interests of a subset of your board, and it might be simpler just to have that done in a, in a separate session, often just before or just after the board meeting. But usually committees are... a when you get past the jungle and past the dirt road and you're on the highway looking for the big, the big win. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're more than five people on the board, so if you're a board of seven people, that's where it makes sense to have a compensation committee of three people. Just It just allows that discussion and decision to happen a lot faster. They can then recommend it to the board. Same thing with, with the audit. It's nice to have just a couple people focused on that instead of everyone's time. Um, the nominating committee is the third committee. You really don't need that until you're you're really ready to go public. During one of the pre-calls before this session, I, I think it was Sharon who mentioned that, that it was unusual for CEOs to sort of get a grade on their performance uh, from a, a board meeting. Is it, is, should the CEO be asking for feedback after the board meeting about how they did? And should the outside directors be offering that assessment well, I think of the, the piece, so I think it's really good practice to have, to plan to have a closed session at the end of the board meeting. So, and often it's kind of two-step meeting. There's one where it's just the, where there's no non-board member executives, where the CEO and any other executive board members can have a discussion. And that's where you say, oh, I'm really concerned about my sales leadership, you know, I'm keeping a watchful eye, those kind of things. And then there's a closed session where it's, um, the not only outside directors, meaning the investors and the outside directors, no management. And it's a good practice once the company has reached, say, mid-stage. You don't need that necessarily early stage, but, in, but it's a good practice to set having that because then if there is an issue, you have a regular practice of having closed session to discuss the issues, and it's not a big red flag going up like, hey, we're about to fire you because we want to have a closed session. Um, but after the closed session, someone from the board, ha I think, has a responsibility to go to the CEO and say, this is what we talked about in the closed session. These are the concerns. These are the things we're really excited about. 
this is what we think could be going better. And I don't think of it so much as a grade on the meeting, because the meeting is, you know, two to four hours out of a 13 week long quarter. It's how, how are we doing collectively and what are our concerns? And, you know, it, it's a moment to crystallize giving the feedback, but it's not about those, it's not usually just about those few hours that just passed. And by the way, we usually attend the closed session, so if you're the CEO, please don't ask us what the board talked about in the closed session because we, we, it's a general matter. We won't we won't tell you. you know, we 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 report to the company, not not directly you. And so if the board is having a confidential executive session without you, and they talk about something, it's because they don't want you there for that that moment, and it's not it's not our job to communicate that. Sharon or Jules will will do that afterwards. Um, we we. Dan mentioned that you know he expects he expects observers and board members to to, to be helpful. It, do you do you send the board away with with homework? Um, do, you, do you call them out saying I need this, I need that? Absolutely, both generally and individually. So we maintain a list of all the executive hires we're trying to make. Shockingly, we share that list with our board using a cloud-based content management service. Um, the same service we use, of course, to share all of our board decks with them. Um, so there's always that. We're always recruiting, and we expect every investor to be actively seeking talent that might be a fit for our needs. And then absolutely, for example, we're just beginning to expand in Asia, and, uh, and so we're focused on Tokyo in particular. And yeah, I mean, I've fired off a list of specific asks to specific investors who I think can help us whether it's help me choose a recruiting firm or I want an introduction to somebody at Panasonic or, or whatever. Now they may come back and say, I did. But many times <laughs> they'll be able to help in, in some constructive way. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely expect all of our investors, whether they have a board seat or not, to be open to my asking for that kind of help, to, to the company asking for that kind of help. And uh, if they can't help, they can't help, that's fine. Your, your board is an asset, and you should use it like any other asset as a tool to help you be successful. In addition to these ideas, uh, you can have your board a lot of times. Some of your board members might be good in terms of uh, mentoring some of your executives, especially where they have certain skills, their sales background, help your salesperson, etc. Also, sometimes it can be helpful to get uh, one board member, maybe a couple board members in with your team to uh, help you work through some issues, either the brainstorming phase or you know, uh, wrestling with tough stuff and get some inputs. Uh, the more you have your board involved in helping you, the more they know about the business, the more likely it is they can uh, help you and see, uh, you see when you have a tough issue and you hit that spot where the highway all of a sudden turns back to a dirt road and you really need their backing, the more they know about your company and your people, the more they trust you and your people because of interactions, the more likely it is they'll help you get over those pots in the road rather than, you know, fire your ass. You know, viewing for you is another one. Yeah, just uh, one, one key thing there is not only your board member, but if they're uh, an investor, the firm. Like we've leveraged different partners at the firm who have a strength or a skill. And we don't wait for the board meeting to do that. I think it's more fluid. We're doing that constantly, right, with our board asking for them to interview a candidate, introduce a candidate, introduce a, a potential client. You know, just think of the leverage you can get from those relationships. I'll let them open it up to questions. Um, hi, my name is Adriano from WatchUp. My question is, uh, does it make sense for a pre-Series A company to have a board of directors? Well, you technically have to have at least one. Sure, but like three or five or seven yep. people. Uh, if, if you haven't raised any venture money yet, uh, you know, adding, getting rid of board members is hard, so um, just, just don't add board members unless you're really sure they're going to be able to help you for the long run, would be my suggestion. But having advisors is always good. You can have advisors without them being on your board, though. That's a way to handle it at uh, early stage. Yeah, I like the advisor path. And just a little bit of guidance there. Early on, we had um, advisors. And we said, oh my gosh, this person has done this and that. And they're going to be amazing. And we ended up giving them stock and talking to them twice and then never using them again. And you know, and looking back, I'm like, I thought it was so important for us to have this list of advisors because I thought it would bring us credibility and it'd be this great asset, and it's just not true. 
So I would get leverage where you need leverage, like have coffee with somebody and get some good guidance if they're willing to do it. And whether or not you formalize the advisor relationship, try before you buy. So um, this is a founder's dilemma I had. Uh, so I was really young when I started my company. I uh, hired a CEO with a lot of experience. And um, I was told that CEO is the speaker at the board meeting and, and you shouldn't really, the two of you should align as a founder and as a CEO. And uh, I have a lot of regrets actually that I didn't, I didn't speak enough uh, at the board meetings uh, as a founder. I mean, we were venture funded, we had a decent exit. Uh, and I'm fine with that, but you know we could have been something better and more. And really, the where it really came down to was uh, CEO focus. Uh, I wanted to do a few things, and I wanted to do it well. And CEO was scattered uh, all over the place, and he had a lot of experience. So I was sort of in a cast 22. Uh, if I open my mouth too much, he might exit. If if he, if he exits, that's not a good thing for my company. We really needed him. He had the, he had the expertise on the background. So I'm wondering, how do you manage, and I was with the, on the company board on the Series B as a founder, how do you manage this? Uh, what's the remedy for this? I mean, did I do some, is there something that I should have done as a founder uh, to step up to the board? And I, and I think there were things that the board should have realized they did. So I'm wondering if there's a remedy to this. I think it's always a really tough issue when you've got founder CEO dynamics. I think you, you have to understand when you're in the board meeting, the CEO does need to run the board meeting. So I, I, my advice would have been to, to try to figure out that, that stuff offline with the CEO before the board meeting. And if you're really not aligned, you've got a problem with this. You've, you have more experience than the CEO because you are the founder. And, and uh, it's really important that you guys get on the same page before the board meeting. If, if, if you really have significant issues and you know, you can't, um, you, you want the company to go in a certain direction, the CEO's in the exact opposite direction. As the founder, that's where you have to be really careful with the, as Sharon said, sort of the, uh, the assassination thing, because when you go to the board member, you're really saying, I don't have confidence in this person anymore. They either need to uh, get rid of the CEO or they need to uh, get rid of you. But somebody has to go, if, if there really is that strong disagreement. Right, and I would, so I think that, so that is a classic issue. Um, and I've seen it happen, and I've, I've had it happen, We've, I've made mistakes. The, I would say generalizing some advice I'll give is, is getting some, so number one is talking to the other directors and the CEO uh, offline, sharing your concerns, but, how did, but you have to do it in a constructive way that doesn't look like you're not committed to his path, right? So I find if you can raise issues in such a way that the other person thinks that your solution is his or her idea, you have a way better chance of getting that person to take up your cause than if you go and say, we have to do this, we have to do this, this is what we should do, you know, you're wrong, I'm right, you have to do this, right? So that, and like I said, that's a general comment, but it's really true in board dynamics where it's a group of five or seven people trying to make a decision together. So the, the more each individual thinks this idea is the right thing to do individually, the better chance you have of getting the whole thing to swing your way. But that requires, that's a lot of legwork and kind of subtle conversations and proof points and fact. And you can't make it look like you're going through a whole bunch of palace intrigue in the process. All the way to the back. I'd like to clarify something that Sharon said a little while ago about the closed uh, session board meeting where the CEO isn't part of the board meeting. Many of the CEOs that I've encountered are these dynamic personalities that not only control the company, but control the board. And so if there's a problem, they control everything. I like the idea of, of having the CEO not be on the board, and but run the board meeting, but not be on the board, so that the board is controlling the CEO ultimately. Does that make sense or not make sense? And if not, what do you do about it? How do you solve that? I've never seen a company where the CEO is not on the board. I mean, it, that. I mean, my experience, it's only when things have gone tragically wrong. Um, <laughs> no, but there, there are lots of companies where the chairman and the CEO are different people. Yes. Right. Or, or yeah, or lead. Yes. So, and yes, there could be chairman and CEO, or lead director and CEO. Because sometimes the CEO, sometimes the CEO really cares about the chairman title, which, as one of my CEOs said, it's like Queen of England. You have no actual authority, <laughs> but it's a, it's a really exciting title to have. 
Um, but yeah, there should be another person. Uh, I mean, even if you're <coughs> even as a CEO, it's often handy to have a second in command on the board, whether it's official or unofficial, but someone who will step in in the moment and take charge of a situation that's gone sideways, and then also run the closed session. So, so what would be typical then to have your board meeting with the CEO on the board in that board meeting, then have the, sec the closed session without the CEO as a normal thing? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Totally normal. Okay. So, so if you're at an early stage, you're still in the jungle uh, stage, and you're the founder, and you're talking to you know people possibly at the advisory role at that point, so what characteristics should I look for saying, hey, he is good for me as, as an advisor, or he should be in my board, or maybe he has enough characteristics I want to bring him as a CEO for my company. So, you know, how do, what characteristics I look for the three roles to make decisions? Well, I think you have to figure out what personal characteristics are important to you, right? So what kind of people do you want to work with? Uh, what what adjectives are you going to use to describe that person? And if you're going to get in the trenches with them, is it going to be somebody that you're going to be able to work with and agree with and get behind and not always agree with, but be able to communicate to and you know be open and honest and an effective communicator and high integrity and you know that list has to come from you. And then I would say, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What is it that you need? Like, don't go out and and get a bunch of people as advisors if you don't really need anything. You know what I mean? So it's what kind of problems are you trying to solve? What opportunities are you going after? What do you need? And and uh, so what distinguishes an advisor from a board member? Like in terms of characteristics, I might need something from the advisor at the early stage, you know, and then later on as a board member, it's different. Right? I would try before you buy. Don't add a board member. You, you know, make sure you want to get married. Date a while, right? Like, don't just go propose marriage. Like, you know, date for a while, right? Uh, chemistry is really important, and you can't figure that out without having interacted with people a lot. So, if you can't rent before you buy, at least meet with them a lot. And, you know, you've got to have chemistry where it doesn't mean you're going to think alike, but where you can talk about issues. Um, and the second thing is really make sure you share a vision. If you're trying to go one place and the other person trying to go another place, you know, you're going to have huge problems. And and from as, a pure, a, as a board member, so maybe different than advisor, a board member also has to be able to work and play nice in a group setting um, where that board member has actually very little actual authority to do anything. So, which is very, you know, an advisor, you might have someone who's super dynamic, big voice, but then gets the board meeting and just wants to use that big voice all the time and it and that's disruptive. So you can try out, you can audition potential board members by inviting them as a guest to your board meeting and see, assess two things. What are they like in the group session? And what's the quality of their insight and the usefulness and actionability of their feedback to you? And is, you know, so is this person a creative or dilutive to the experience? The other thing is just being practical. If you're an early stage company, you've got to remember that your investors will want board seats. And you, you want to make sure you're, you're always keeping in mind the control element down the road. And since it is hard to get somebody off a board, you, you want to think very carefully about whether you actually want to make an advisor or a board member, knowing that you're going to have two or three uh, investors coming on the board right here. So there are different uh, events in your life of a company where liability so can you talk a little bit about uh, the protection of uh, independent uh, board members and also the compensation side? I, I, I'm happy to answer the first question because that's more of a pure technical legal element. Comp, uh, do, 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 Oh, um, protection associated with having independent board members was the first question and the second question was board comp. Yeah, I mean, on comp, usually it's it's uh, just equity. I mean, sometimes you'll pay, as a public company, you may pay you know some small amount. You usually pay for expenses if there's travel or things like that. But equity is anywhere from 0.5% of the company all the way to 2%. I've seen it at the really early stage. Um, the weird thing with, with the equity is that it doesn't really change that much, even as you get bigger and bigger in scale. So, um, so it's better to, you know, you should really try to think about um, 
not hiring the not not uh, inviting the independent director too early into your business. I think a lot of companies they feel they need an independent director at the beginning. You know, you can often attract. You know, you're going to get the same amount of equity anyway, so you can often attract even someone better for the same amount of equity down the road when you're you're closer to going public. And it is really hard to get people off. So here's a warning sign that that a director thinks something uh, is worried about the company when the question comes up to the CFO. What's our DNO insurance? That's when you know that that director <laughs> thinks that there's a, you know may not even have telegraphed to the CEO something wrong could be going, but you know that that we all expect you know in that's directors uh, and officers insurance, and it's important. That, so, but that but you should have it, and then but when somebody wants to review what it is, <laughs> do everything. Hi, Abraham. Earlier about the secondary for early investors, and I was wondering your experience and how do you see the trend of uh, management uh, getting some uh, pre-IPO liquidity as the life cycle of private companies extends. I'm going to maybe ask if you can take that one after because it's outside of the scope of the discussion. I was talking specifically to Dan. Um, you know, our time is extremely limited, so I'm going to. Just out of uh, curiosity, how much time do you allocate so that you can mostly effective to communicate with the board? For example, do you structure, let's see, uh, once a week you have one uh, hour that you'll think about board-related issues or um, a month. How do you uh, allocate your time so that you mostly effect both formally at the board meeting and also informally with individual board members? Any of you who have ever heard me give my lessons learned in 25 years talk will know that I think how you allocate your time is the most important decision you make. Um, and uh, humorously, I don't have a specific allocation towards my board. It depends what's going on. I, I like to touch base with people on a regular basis. So it just happens that in the last week I had breakfast with one observer and then a meeting with one board member offline. But I don't set aside a specific amount of time. I think the important thing for me is, you know, we're all human beings and we want to have a relationship with each other. So I want to spend enough time with my board members and my observers that I have a relationship with them, that I, there's a level of trust and a level of communication with them. And then, then it's dependent on what's going on in the business and their particular interests. If they've got some real interest in some topic that's hot right now, I might spend more time with somebody rather than less. But. Uh, there are many things in my process for doing my job where I sort of allocate how much time I want to spend on them, but interacting with our board isn't one of them. So I have a question about, it is about relationship management, I think, a lot of this. And, um, you know, when you get a new investor in, it's typically everything's looking good, it's clearly they're putting the money in. And, and what's hard to anticipate is the interpersonal dynamic that happens. And usually um, that actually clashes when it's a tough decision, because that's when all hell breaks loose. So maybe you can anecdotally talk a little bit about managing the personality. I mean, there's some ego there, there's different agendas, there's fiduciary responsibility, there's a lot of dynamic going on. Um, so I'd love to hear anecdotally, I mean, and, and what, you know, what also often happens is you take these out to dinner, and there's off strategy sessions, there's other things you can do to sort of nurture and, and, and foster relationships. But I'd, I'd love to hear anecdotally how you've smoothed certain internet, interpersonal dynamics over time with your boards. I think it's like how you would manage a relationship in any context, whether it be a, a you know one of your vice presidents, one of your board members, you know, understanding what they're good at, what they're not, what their motivation is, um, you know, why are why are they doing it, right? I mean, is it impact? Is it growth and development? Financial reward? Balance? What's important to them? And then managing to it. One interesting thing is I, I had a boss who used to say, "Everything's funny when you're making money." You know, when things are going well, you don't see the dynamics. You don't really get to see it. It's when things, when, if you hit a thorny issue or there's a really tough decision or something happens in your business that's a speed bump, it's really interesting to see what happens then, right? Who panics, who, who uh, buckles down. And we had an opportunity to see, you know, one of our board members really step up in a, you know, in a difficult time. And it was mind-boggling to see how this person really, like, just such a problem solver and worked over time and you know really to get this thing resolved and it, it was really impressive to see how that skill came out you you didn't anticipate it beforehand 
So I think it's uh, you know getting into those difficult situations, getting to see how people are going to react, learning from those. You know, experience is what you get when you don't get the other things you want. So you get thrown in that situation, you're gonna you're gonna learn from that, and then you're gonna know how to handle it next time. If people mention reference checking uh, your directors. I always suggest that you should always reference check with people from companies who failed, because that's that's how you that's how you really know whether the board member is going to be constructive. Can I make a specific suggestion? So for where you have follow-on rounds with a new investor and a new board member, that firm and that person just did a whole bunch of work on your company, and I would encourage you to have them discuss that work, their findings their hopes and aspirations and their concerns with the board as a whole. And so coming in, you know, basically as if they were presenting to their partnership the pros and cons of this investment, bringing that to the team and saying, this is what we, these are the customers we spoke to, this is what we heard in feedback, you know, privately to the CEO when I did references on your, on your executive team, I have concerns about this, like just, Getting people to articulate what the thought bubbles in their head is when they're sitting at the meeting and you knowing it is so much more helpful because then you, you can understand, hey, they really think we shouldn't be going after this part of the market, we should be going after that part of the market, and that's what they're hoping for. But you know, I have to figure out how to square the circle with the other investor who, you know, that's where we started and that's our roots or something like that. But getting the getting the facts on the table and getting, like I said, the hopes and aspirations and their concerns. When you get stuff out in the air, you can deal with it. When it's hidden, it's very hard. We'll do two more questions. Um, hi, first time founder and CEO. I've been running board meetings for about a year now, and I'm improving as much as I can on my own, but is there a more structured, better way to get tighter feedback after each board meeting, and not necessarily by the board members, but any coach or anything you guys have done on your own that have helped you grow a lot through board meetings? So there are people who do this for a living, uh, who coach young CEOs on how to interact with their board. They'll come to your board meetings, they'll watch you, they'll take notes. They work for you, not for the board, so they'll give you the feedback. And there are also people who will do it informally, who are you know, more on a mentorship kind of a, kind of a role, who maybe were CEOs or were senior executives in, or investors or venture capitalists. So absolutely, there are resources that can help you. Can, uh, can you guys, or can any of you give some concrete examples of what a dysfunctional board member looks like? Someone you might want to get rid of. You sort of talk about it in general. I'm wondering, like, very concretely what that looks like. I have a picture. I'll show you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. How many different flavors are there? Sure, <laughs> anything. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the person who talks too much, uh, the person who tries to railroad the meeting, the person who has an ax to grind against the CEO. Um, Goes off topic, topic all the time. Off yeah. topic, wants to go deep on every little detail where it's not really relevant or important. Right. Or somebody else asks a question at the beginning of the day, because I experience this a lot um, as an executive. The I, yes, the idea a minute the well because we're in this business isn't that kind of similar to this and this and this and shouldn't you expect that and you've just spent all your time getting your team aligned behind an idea and then you go to the board meeting and it's you know please investigate these seventeen things that have a word in common with our business model but that's it. Um. Yeah, my my pet peeve is the people who give you know, specific advice that's unique to them. So I was, I was using your product and I really noticed that this button here wasn't, you know, it didn't really, and, and they bring it up in the board meeting. And, uh, and it's like, you are a data point of one. And so if the feedback was, let's do a customer survey, or I've noticed that, you know, it, this could be an issue, it's okay to do that either privately with the CEO, but yeah, I, I think it's really frustrating. I also don't like board members who are not engaged. So one of our CEOs, we were doing eight board meetings for one of my companies, they said, you know what, we're going to move to five a year, but everybody has to be there in person. So we have no, this is a New York company, we have no phone calls, uh, people dialing in. You know, I think the worst thing is actually, it's, and these people are hard to get rid of because they don't cause a lot of problems, they're just not engaged, but they're just calling in, they're not making meetings. I, I think, you know, you, you need to use the board as a weapon, and so that means that you need five or six really functional people engaged in your business that are working with you, for you. 
And you know, they, they haven't done their homework, and they're not adding value. It's not accretive to the meeting. There's no, uh, you know, no siege advice. There's no, uh, you know, it's just not value add. And those are those examples are that's enough that you might actually want to start thinking about replacing them with another board member. The examples you guys gave. Well, you you failed as CEO if you have a dysfunctional board member. It's, it's incumbent upon you if you're starting the company and you're there from the start, is to be very, very careful about adding board members and do your homework. Uh, you know, we all make recruiting mistakes, but one of the worst ones you can have is to have somebody on your board that becomes dysfunctional. It's extremely hard to fix, so just avoid it in the first place. I mean, if they're neutral, it's bad, but if they're disruptive, it's worse. You know what I mean? So if they're not adding value, it's one thing, but if they're disrupting the meeting or... Uh, and, and if they're dysfunctional in a really negative way, you know, other people don't. So checking references and stuff, you know, that's the way to do it. I have one last question in yellow. Yes, uh, I've heard of board scorecards. I want to know if you've used them and how effective are they? Board scoring the CEO or the CEO scoring the board? Or? No, I've done it in a public company only where you, where you review both the CEO as well as the nominating committee reviews the CEO, but also gives performance reviews to each director and to each committee. Um, it's a lot of work, it's highly political, it's not fun, um, but it is a specific form that you can use to try to affect change. So where, in particular where you have a, a board member who's not pulling his or her weight, it's a, it, it is a way to give that person feedback. Now, not very many people like to go and deliver that kind of feedback, um, but sometimes you have to do it. You know, people hate uh, feedback in a lot of ways in private companies, but I think uh, it's probably a good idea for the CEO once a year to sit down and talk with the board and just talk about, here's things that you could do to help me run the company more effectively. That's about as much as you're going to do. So yeah, you should always encourage the board to give you feedback as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's important the board meeting is not a performance. It's not dress rehearsals and then you need to be, you know, and then you're performing. How did I do? You know, 10.0. Um, so I'd really, I'd really make it an open discussion, and um, you know, rather than performance. If you could join me in thanking the panel.